And welcome once again to EWTN's Bookmark. I'm Doug Keck, your host. Our special guest is Father Joseph Fessio, SJ. He's the publisher of Ignatius Press. We're going to talk about a book, Western Culture Today and Tomorrow, put together by Joseph Ratzinger, Benedict XVI. It's great to see you, Father Fessio. How are you doing? Good to see you too, Doug. I'm doing fine. I'm sheltering here uh, in San Francisco. Right. And we're, we're keeping a social distance, Doug. We're about 3,000 miles apart, so I think we're safe. Yeah, so far it looks pretty good. In fact, you were on with Father Mitch back in the summer. Uh, people got to see that interview as well. It was great to see two uh, superior Jesuits going back and forth in a discussion about uh, Pope Benedict the, the 16th. So we wanted to talk to you about this book and how it was put together. Whose idea was it to take these essays and put it into book form? Well, I'm not sure. That would be the Germans, probably uh, Herder Company. But basically, you know, Professor Ratzinger, you know, Car uh, Cardinal Bennett, Ratzinger, and Pope Benedict didn't write very many books. Mm -hmm. uh, although they published maybe 50 or 60 what would be called books, but most of them were like this a collection of essays, a collection of homilies, a collection of speeches, mm -hmm. and so on. There's very few books are written as such. Jesus of Nazareth is one of them. Mm -hmm. The introduction to the spiritual, spirit of the liturgy is another one. But uh, what happened was he'd be, give, he'd be giving talks on various topics, and he'd be invited many times. And so uh, someone would gather these together and have them published. We were always on the scene to say we want to do the English version. Mm -hmm. But this particular book uh, was basically based on some talks he was asked to give about religion and politics, how... how the Catholic faith is meant mm -hmm. to be uh, intersect with political action. Right. Now, in the, the forward is actually put together by George Weigel, who talks about uh, Pope Benedict. He said he had no particular interest in partisan politics, but good Augustinian that he was was a survivor of Nazi Germany, understood that a state without justice is simply a band of robbers. And he goes on to talk about the whole idea of uh, the fundamentally cultural in nature in his writings much more than they are political or economic. That is right. And that made it more uh, contemporary. I, Doug, I spent my life reading manuscripts and reading books. Uh, I spell, saying mass, of course, the most important thing. But uh, because I was asked to go on with my good friend, uh, Father Paco, discuss mm -hmm. this book, I had to reread it. And it was, it was basically published in German in 2004, so 16 years old. And four of the essays in the back are on the 60th anniversary of D-Day, so that's even older in terms of an event. But as I read this book, Doug, I said, th this helps us understand what's going on right now in 2020 and what we can do about it, what our role is supposed to be. Uh, so I was, again, I love... Paul Benedict, Cardinal Ratzinger, I love his writing. I think he's a great man of the church. I think he'll be a doctor of the church someday as well as a saint. Uh, but this book gives us a broader view of mm -hmm. where we got to where we are now. And, you know, they're, they're, they're pulling down statues, not just of General Bragg, a mm -hmm. Confederate soldier, or General Lee, not just of Ulysses S. Grant, who basically won the Civil War, not just of Jefferson and, and Washington, bad enough, they're pulling down statues of Cervantes. Mm -hmm. well, why? He represents Western culture, mm -hmm. which is being considered today a colonializing culture, uh, which is a, which is a root of racism. And so we have this cancel culture movement. Right. And Ratzinger shows us what our culture really is, what are negative aspects of it, and what the positive aspects are of it, and how we as Catholics especially have to maintain it, preserve it, and purify it. Right. He talked about the idea that the West for, f was foremost a cultural achievement with a history and that the history is forged by the interaction of Jerusalem, Athens, and Rome, the, the, the three legs of the stool. And he goes on also, and I wanted to ask you about this, that Ratzinger once put it in a 1998 lecture to Asian theologians, it was providential that the first enculturation of the gospel took place where the principle of non-contradiction was secure. Why? That's right, because we had in, in the Eastern philosophies, we had this idea of, of, you know, I am you and you are me and, you know, I am it. Uh, no distinction of persons. Even the even the, the highest they got towards some kind of a, of a, 
uh, higher life, uh, you know, heaven, would be nirvana, where all individual differences are extinguished. And so it was the Greeks especially, as well as the Jews, uh, you know, that's Jerusalem, to emphasize the unviable, inviolable dignity of the human person, mm -hmm. uh, and that we can be one. And of course, it's based in the Trinity, because in the Trinity, you've got one God, but you've got three persons. Right. And so in the West, because of Jerusalem, as well as because of, of Athens, we have this idea of God as reasonable, logos, and human life as personal dignity, where all are equal in God's sight. That's the importance of both Jerusalem and Athens in our history. Right. Weigel mentions that uh, in his estimation, Ratzinger drew his analysis of the West's postmodern crisis. Its 19th century Western high culture decided to kick the Jerusalem leg out from under the stool when its atheistic uh, humanists, as Andre de Lubac dubbed them, declared the God of the Bible the enemy of human maturation and liberation. Is that the effects we're seeing now? Yes, it absolutely is. And uh, in this book, uh, Pope Benedict or Ratzinger, as he's writing it, is speaking of what he calls the third turning point in Western culture, which was the French Revolution, mm -hmm. in which for the first time we had a purely secular society. And he says we, we've mythologized progress, science, and freedom. So the progress is whatever you can do, whatever is new, try it. Uh, science is we only can know what we can understand empirically and, and experiment on. And freedom is no restraints to do whatever you feel like doing as long as you don't harm someone else clearly, you know, indirectly. But he says we have to have a counterbalance of that in the third leg of the stool, mm -hmm. which is the faith, which is Jerusalem, to show that we have to have moral criteria for progress. You know, just because we can uh, assemble, you know, in a test tube, uh, make, so to speak, a human baby, mm -hmm. does not mean we should do it. Just because we can experiment on an embryo that's been aborted doesn't mean we should do it. Likewise with science, uh, the idea that our reason is only limited to empirical observation and experiment is a truncation of reason. It's a reduction of reason, and we have to open up to the transcendent. Finally, on freedom, freedom is not just license or absence of restraint. It's the faculty we have to be able to choose what is good and true and beautiful on our own. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, that, that, that's how right. Ratzinger clearly shows here what the remedy is to the ills of this cancel culture that we're now uh, seeing right. its effects. And you mentioned with this progressive mentality, do you think that iconoclasm we're dealing with in a sense is because not only do we, do we think we know more, we think we're better? Well, of course, there's a historical snobbism there that, you know, uh, we think that progress means that every age is better than the age before. It's Of course, my smartphone is better than my cell phone was 10 years ago. We're now talking, you know, over the Internet uh, through technology that wasn't available 50 years wow. ago or even, even. But that doesn't mean that you and I are more superior to Augustine mm -hmm. or even Socrates, for that matter. Right, exactly. Now, in the chapter, uh, Europe at Spiritual Foundations, uh, he makes the point, multiculturalism, which is continually and passionately encouraged and promoted, and sometimes little more than the, is sometimes little more than the abandonment and denial of what is one's own flight from one's own heritage. That's right. And I, I think we should respect and admire other cultures, at the same time recognizing that there's something that is really superior about Western culture. In fact, the great Newman, now Saint John Henry Newman, said that Western civilization is the only civilization you can write with a capital C because it, it represents the fullness of human development. Again, mm -hmm. Greek philosophy, Roman law, uh, Jewish and Christian charity and revelation, those three are uh, Un incommensurable mm -hmm. with other civilizations. Does that mean that we are better? <laughs> Not at all. It means we have a lot more opportunities and advantages, call it white privilege, 
we might just call it European privilege in the sense that we have a culture which nourishes and supports the flourishing of, of human talent. Right. And does that mean the Chinese don't have anything to offer? Absolutely not. I mean, uh, or or the Incas or the Aztecs or the Africans, whoever you want to say. Are so you, we should rec right. we should go ahead. Are go you ahead, su are you surprised I'm, in a sense by the the level of almost self hating about culture that you see in the West? Doug, I'm an old man. I've lived through one of the most tumultuous periods in modern history. I'm not surprised by anything. In fact, I'm surprised it didn't happen sooner. Hmm. You know, once you abandoned God, mm -hmm. which basically happened in a lot of the French Revolution, and once you abandoned the church's teaching from immemorial times of the unity of love and procreation in the sexual act, then you're going to have anarchy. You're going to have contraception. You're going to have abortion. You're going to have euthanasia. You're going to have homosexual union. It all follows as night follows day. And believe me, it's a dark night. Right. Now, also in this, he talks about, in thinking about the future of Europe, he talks about, in the regard, we must say that Toynbee was correct, that the destiny of a society depends on creative minorities. And I think he's relating to the church as being one of those. Can it still be that? Yes, it, it can and it is. And I, as I mentioned, Father Pacwa, uh, you know, this is something that Benedict has said uh, for a long time. We have another book by him, which is 50 years. Uh, it was first issued years ago. I forget the title, unfortunately, but uh, he has an essay on the future of the church there. And he says the church in the future is not going to have the, the influence in society. It used to have the Middle Ages and even up to the French Revolution. However, mm -hmm. he said... The church will become smaller, more intense, more intentional, and that it will be there as a refuge and as a haven for our secular society when it reaches the end of the rope and realizes it's a dead end, you know. Uh, so he does say, in fact, I'll, I will quote you, uh, Doug, it's a wonderful passage here uh, from page 155 towards the end. Mm -hmm. It says, in the old church, the ancient church, the catechumenate, which is a way of preparing Christians, I mean, preparing pagans to become Christian, kind of a school of, of Christianity. In the old church, the catechumenate was created as a living space set apart from an increasingly demoralized culture, which is what we've got today. A space in which that distinctive innovation of the Christian way of life was practiced and at the same time protected from the common mode of living. Mm -hmm. I think that even today, something like catechumenal communities are needed hmm. so that the Christian life with all its character can hold its own ground. And I told Father Packwood, Doug, I said, that's what EWDN is. Mm -hmm. you, know, you are helping to create a virtual catechumenate of those who are serious about their faith uh, around the country and around the world. Right. Ignatius Press, we try to do it by our books. I've called home schools the monasteries of the new dark ages, because we're entering a new dark age. The barbarians are at the door. I mean, you, you, these the peaceful protesters we've seen, okay, great, I'm all for that. Mm -hmm. But looting, burning, pillaging, raping, mm -hmm. shooting, killing, that's not peaceful protest. Right. And they're coming, yeah. after, they're coming after statues now. Wow. But uh, if we don't stop them, they're gonna move beyond the statues well, to the- Right, exactly. You know, and they're, and they're coming after the ideals and the ideas behind those statues. Yes, yes. Now, he also said, speaking of, you talk about the new dark ages, he talks about today we find ourselves in the midst of a second enlightenment. It, is, it, it has proposed a rational goal for the future, which is entitled the new world order. It is now supposed to become, in its turn, the essential ethical norm. It still shares with Marxism the evolutionary idea of a universe brought forth by an irrational event and formed by its intrinsic rules. It's interesting that he would use that term. Yes, uh, it is. And, of course, my good friend, you probably know him, Tom Howard, Thomas mm -hmm. Howard, a great sure. author, a great mm -hmm. Christian, a great man. He would never talk about the Enlightenment. He called it the Endarkenment. <laughs> now, uh, Ratzinger is, is, is very open to anything which is good in any change. And so he recognized... Uh, many positive values in the Enlightenment, the French Enlightenment, especially in the English Enlightenment. Uh, but 
it, when it when it excludes religion, when God becomes reason only, apart from revelation and apart from anything uh, divine characteristics, then you lose human dignity. And Father Packle also referred to, oh, so did George Wiley, introduction here, to Henri de Lubac's book, The Drama of mm -hmm. Atheist Humanism. And the idea there is that if you try and have a humanism without God, you end up destroying man. And as the Lubac, that, by the way, is another book, Doug, which is, it, it, it's a fairly serious book, but it's readable. Right. By de Lubac called The Drama of Atheist Humanism. He shows that in the late 19th century, you had Nietzsche, you had uh, Feuerbach, and I think you had Kant for social. So, and the church had no response. But who responded? Dostoevsky. Mm -hmm. and Dostoevsky's novels make it clear that without God, all things become possible. There's no moral standards anymore. Right. It's interesting, too, because he, he talked about the visions of Huxley are definitely becoming a reality. It's interesting because we hear all, a lot about Brave New World, but it's interesting because you think of it in terms of 1984, which you kind of have pain driving society. In Huxley, you've got pleasure driving society, and that seems to be where maybe we are. Yes, I want to see if I can find this quote here from, from Huxley uh, that was sent to me just the other day. Darn it, I don't, I don't see it here. Uh, but it's amazing. Uh, oh, wait a minute. No, that's not it. Oh, I had a beautiful quote from Huxley. Mm -hmm. uh, but about they, they'll, they'll destroy history. They'll tear down the statues. I mean, he basically said everything we've already seen. Right. Exactly. Exactly. But it was also interesting here that Benedict says, the human being cannot become a product. He cannot be produced. He can only be begotten. That's right. And what he's saying there is if science has no moral criteria, then anything that's possible you think is, is legitimate, but it's not. I mean, we can't do that. Right, as you said, as you mentioned before. He says, but all of this is possible only if we acquire a new sense of the dignity of suffering. I thought this was interesting. Learning to live also means learning to suffer. And again, that Huxley thing of pleasure pulling away that aspect of suffering. Yeah, I, I found this quote, I uh, guess is from George Orwell, 1984. Mm -hmm. Every book has been rewritten, every picture has been repainted, every statue and street and building has been renamed, every date has been altered, history has stopped, nothing exists except an endless present in which the party is always right. Wow. Right, exactly. And they, they determine exactly what is always correct. It, it's kind of like Pol Pot in the year zero, uh, for those who remember the old movie on the killing fields, uh, and, and that whole idea of, of starting over. He, he also says in the section, Political Visions and the Praxis of Politics, he says, Marxism then increasingly became in the West the religion of the intellectuals, whereas workers had won their right through reforms, which made it superfluous for them to plan the revolution. He said, in the world of the intellectuals, the well-to-do really are the ones behind this. Yes, and we're seeing that today, are we not? Right. These so-called coastal elites. I guess I'm, I'm part of the coastal elite, Doug, because I'm in San Francisco. However, I'm a, I'm a contrarian. <laughs> You're down there in, in Alabama. Thank God for Alabama. Amen. You know, and, and, the, and the rest of the flyover country. We're counting on you. He also goes on to say the foundation of this concept of history consists on the one hand in the theory of evolution transferred to history, and on the other hand, not entirely unconnected with a previous element in Hegel's version of faith in progress, which you were talking about earlier. Yes, exactly. This idea of, of uh, uh, almost Teilhardian idea, everything that rises must converge, we're all moving towards a, a higher unity. Well... You know, the, the last book of the Bible has a different view on things. I, I encourage people to read the book, The Revelation of St. John. Right. Good. Well put. Revolution and utopia, the nostalgia for a perfect world, are connected. They, they are the concrete forms of this new political secularized messianism. The idol of the future devours the present, and the idol of revolution is the adversary of reasonable political action. Yes, and uh, related to that, Doug, on page 61, 
he's so he's so insightful. He says, politicians of all parties, for politicians of all parties, the obvious thing to do today is to promise change. Mm -hmm. Of course, change is for the better. One would have to conclude, however, that in modern society, a deep sense of dissatisfaction predominates. And this precisely in places where well-being and freedom have reached a level heretofore unknown. How is it that in the United States of America, where the level of living for everyone has risen for, for decades and decades and decades, where we have all the food we can eat, places to live, friends, technology, why are we dissatisfied? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we, we're, we're grasping after everything, every novelty. Uh, I, I believe one. there's two things that are lacking, one other thing, but at least mm -hmm. two. One is gratitude, mm -hmm. you know, recognizing the good that we have. Uh, and secondly, who do you be th who you're thankful towards? Well, God, who's given all this, you know. So, right. Well, in his section on political visions and the practices of policies, he also s says, I would say that nowadays three values are predominant in the general consciousness. These three values that are constantly are mythically oversimplified are progress, science, and freedom. That's right, and that's on page 79. Right. And he admits those things are values, but they're oversimplified and mythologized so that progress, if it simply means let's do something which has been done yet, let's, I mean, my, my, my smartphone is better than my cell phone of 10 years ago. We are talking, Doug, through the Internet in a way that was impossible 30, 40 years ago. So this right. is progress in a, in a technological sense. But it doesn't mean that we are morally better than Augustine or Thomas Aquinas or Socrates, for that matter. So the, the moral progress is something which has to be one, one child, one human being at a time, and technological progress does not guarantee it. So his point there is that the myth of progress has got to be mitigated by the truth of moral criteria in judging whether progress is useful. For example, I mean, how valuable really is text messaging and Twitter? Okay, you get some value out of it, but how much time do you spend doing it, you know? I, I, Doug, I've said to people for years, in the television years, I said, watch as much as you want, as long as you pray for as long as you watch television. Now I would say, go ahead, use social media, but spend as much time in prayer as you spend on social media, and all will be well. The second of the three you mentioned, Doug, mm -hmm. is science. And again, science... Uh, without moral criteria, we'll start to do things like, uh, you know, experiment on, on aborted fetuses, you know, mm -hmm. or try and create human life in a test tube. Right. That's morally repulsive and repugnant. You know, or we might create a, we might create biological weapons that we can then we then use. But there's no moral criteria. And finally, freedom is the third one you mentioned that he mentions right. here. It, it's not just an absence of restraint. It's not just a license to do whatever you want as long as you don't harm someone next to you. No, freedom is a capacity to choose what is good mm -hmm. and what is right, what is true, what is beautiful. It's a beautiful gift that God has given us. But it's not just whatever you want to do is fine. Right. It says, nowadays there's a canon of change values that in practice is not called into question even though in reality it is still too indefinite and has gray areas. The triad of peace, justice, and respect for the environment is universally recognized completely indeterminate with regards to its contents. What promotes peace? What is justice? What is the best way to protect the environment? Right. It's like being pro-choice. I'm, I'm, I'm for choice. That's God's gift of a free will to us. Mm -hmm. But it's what you choose that makes a choice good or evil. You know, it, it's the object of the choice which is important. So the content, as he says. By the way, Doug, you, you, you're quoting some great passages mm -hmm. here. I, I am rereading this book. I thought to myself, you know, God bless him. He, he's going to be a doctor of the church, I believe, and a saint someday. But he, his writing is so luminous. It's so profound. And it's so accessible. I mean, he's not, he, he's not some kind of a really abstract uh, ivory tower type person. Right. In a section on In Search of Peace near t towards the end of the book, page 119, the task of Christians, he says, and so it is plain that Christians today face a great challenge. He goes on to say, 
Our task as contemporary Christians is to make sure that our, our, our idea of God is not excluded from the debate about man. That's right. And the whole idea of the naked public square, you know, God and faith being apart from the marketplace, you know, is a total mistake. In fact, he does talk about that also uh, on the relationship of religion and reason. It's on page 101 uh, where he says, you know, there, there's, a, there's pathologies of religion. That is religion gone wild. It goes into terrorism, for example. Right. There's pathologies of reason or reason unrestrained by moral criteria. But he says on page 101, religion must continually allow itself to be purified and structured by reason. Right. And, of course, that's the definition of the Catholic Church. We've, we've, we've embraced Plato. We've embraced Aristotle. Thomas Aquinas has united them. But then he says, this is why reason, too, must be warned to keep within its proper limits. And it must learn a willingness to listen to the great religious traditions of mankind. And so... He, again, he is exactly. a, a man of integration, Doug. I mean, right. he doesn't go off on one little narrow path. He believes in trying to bring together all the riches of what mankind has been able to discover and transmit, but at the same time, not just human things, but what God has told us, you know, through his revelation. Well, we appreciate We're just out of time. Thank you so much, Father Joseph Fessio, publisher of Ignatius Press. Thank you so much for bringing together wonderful books like this uh, into the English language for our audience. The book Western Culture Today and Tomorrow, Fundamental Issues by Joseph Ratzinger, Benedict XVI, again published by Ignatius Press, available proudly through our EWTN religious catalog. EWTNRC.com is the place. Thank you so much, Father Fessio. Thank you, Doug. God bless you. Keep up the good work at EWTN. Thank you very much. And thank you, audience, for joining us this week on Bookmark. We'll see you next time.